And now, here is Walter Bingham. Hello and welcome to the program. It's January the 1st, 2020, which we count in the Hebrew calendar as the 15th of Kislev 5781. Today I'll be telling you about the most extraordinary village in Germany, where throughout the Nazi period they spoke a dialect of Hebrew. Also in the program, there is more from the US presidential election and the rerun in Georgia for their delegates to the Senate that will decide who will control that most important chamber. I shall comment on the instances of insulting use of the Holocaust and talk about the rampant anti-Semitism and about the continuing controversy surrounding the selection of the next director of Yad Vashem, the world's foremost Holocaust education and research institute in Jerusalem. Who is eyeing the position of next president when the current term runs out in June? And who will get the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize? Will Israel's Prime Minister be considered? These are questions discussed in the program today. But first, this. It was in 1995 that I wrote this in Shalom, then a London Jewish newspaper. Domestic violence in Jewish homes is a subject rarely aired in public, but it is becoming a growth industry as the Jewish community mirrors its non-Jewish counterpart. One in three Jewish marriages ends in divorce and abuse of wives and girlfriends is not confined to any one sector. It affects Ashkenazi and Sephardi, Orthodox and Reform, rich and poor, young and old. The late Jewish judge Aaron Owen said at the time, domestic violence has now reached epidemic proportions and we know that the Jewish community is not immune. What is happening in the Christian community is mirrored in the Jewish community. Judge Owen sat in the family division of the High Court and advised the government on domestic violence. He said that the vast majority of petitions are by wives who specify physical assault by the husband. And now, here is Walter Bingham. The vast majority of petitions to the court are by wives who specify physical assault by the husband. Research suggests that violent relationships often involve several cycles. During the buyback or honeymoon phases, the batterer can be a loving and attentive partner. Judge Owen accused the Jewish community of dismissing domestic violence as a problem because it happens behind closed doors. Research at the time revealed that in the USA, between 10% and 20% are affected by this problem. An article in the Jewish Report of 1994 states, quote, 200,000 Israeli women were victims of domestic violence, and when counting the children, nearly one million people live in an atmosphere of terror and violence. One of the most worrying aspects of this issue is the way in which Jewish families seem to protect the abuser and bring pressure to bear on the victim. To break out of the family is the worst sin a woman can commit. It's like tearing up the moral fabric of society. This is how the book All My Fault by D.D. Glass describes the perception battered women have of themselves. When a bullying man brainwashes his partner into feeling that she is worthless without him, too much of the world stands behind him, writes T.D. Glass, who compares misogyny to antisemitism. Quote, if men wouldn't fear women, 
they wouldn't want to demonize, imprison and abuse them. Unfortunately, a grim proportion of apparently happy families are hiding the secret abuse. Women who have lived with violent men experience severe emotional trauma in addition to their physical injuries. Judge Owen has called for rabbis and ministers to get training in how to deal with domestic violence and appeal to the community to start responding to it. All this was written in 1995. On November 25th, it was International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and it's no coincidence that domestic violence is again making headlines in the Israeli media. The lockdowns occasioned by the COVID pandemic is confining families, some with many children, to their apartments for days on end, and that causes friction. Family members are unable to exercise freedom of choice to follow their favorite pastime and compete for space in the home. Parents who cannot go out to work or are unemployed get frustrated, begin to quarrel, and violence follows. With everyone continually at home, separation of the sexes becomes difficult, and that leads to sexual abuse and incest within the family. According to the Rape Crisis Center in Israel, 62% of sexual violence was against minors. Knesset member Yoav Segalovich found that 50% of psychiatric inpatients have a history of sexual assault and the health ministry is not doing enough to deal with such trauma. Domestic violence increases exponentially with the continuance of COVID restrictions. There has always been an element of this abuse behind locked doors that has never been reported to police. But because of COVID, the reported numbers have doubled, but the real extent of the problem can only be estimated. The consequences will manifest themselves in years to come. During this week's visit by Prime Minister Netanyahu and his wife Sarah to a Witzow shelter for women victims of domestic violence, the Prime Minister said, This problem has increased during the coronavirus period. Therefore, we have given 10 million shekel supplement as first aid. I've already directed work to be done on establishing an authority to deal with violence in the family. And to the women of Israel, Netanyahu said, Do not sit at home. Do not accept this violence as given. Take action. Tell about it. Go out. You do not have to live like this, and we will do everything to help you. Mrs. Netanyahu talked about her many visits to such shelters and stressed that when a woman complains about violence by her husband or threats to kill her, it must be taken seriously, and she must be helped. Those who were not believed eventually left home in plastic bags. If you ever find yourself in southern Germany, make a point of visiting Schopfloch, Although it is located on a quiet, romantic road just south of Rothenburg and between Feuchtwangen and Dinkelspül in Bavaria, Schopfloch does not attract much of a tourist trade. With neither walls nor cobbled market squares, it's a fairly quiet village, in many ways typical of the villages to which Jews retreated in the Middle Ages when they were expelled from nearby main cities. Jews lived in the village for many centuries. In the 18th century, Schopfloch had a Jewish mayor, and until the 1830s, the population was one-third Jewish. A decade later, the Jewish community began to decline due to migration back to the cities like Nuremberg and Stuttgart and emigration to the New World. In 1933, when Hitler came to power, there were only 37 Jews left in the village. In the early 30s, there was harmony between Jews and Gentiles. 
One resident remembers that as a boy he opened letters for the pious Jews, who were forbidden this activity on the Sabbath. He got five pfennigs per letter, good money in those days. Many of the Jews did not seem to grasp that the atmosphere was changing. Like most synagogues in Germany, Schopfloch's Jewish House of Prayer was torched during the infamous Kristallnacht in November 1938, and Jews were paraded through the village carrying signs like, I am a Jewish pig. Homes built by Jews can be recognized because their roofs beveled at the tops. The Jewish cemetery has also remained intact. But Schopfloch has something more and that's why most of the visitors are Jewish. They don't come to see the Jewish sights, but rather to hear the Jewish sounds. It was in 1978 when the then mayor of the village, Hans Rainer Hoffmann, was sitting in a tavern where he overheard some elderly people whispering something unintelligible. Not being a native of Schopfloch, he correctly suspected They whispered about him. In the village they had a secret language, and what they said was, the mayor is sitting in the bar filling his belly with booze. The Jewish residents of Schopfloch developed this local patois based largely on Hebrew. In those days many of the Jews were cattle dealers, and they were travelling to Bavarian villages and towns and found that it was convenient to keep trade secrets in a language of their own and speaking it between partners so that their clients couldn't understand them. Over the years, Christians worked in Jewish homes and the community integrated and everyone in Schopfloch learned the dialect known as Lachodesh, a contraction of Lashon HaKodesh, Hebrew for holy tongue. The dialect contains some 2,000 words. Water is Mayem, a house is Bayes, and the village itself is called Medina. Instead of a Bürgermeister, Schopfloch is presided over by a Shofet, Hebrew for judge. Only a few old Schopflochers speak Lachudish, but there is a movement to retain this history. So today's mayor, Oswald Czech, is interested to teach it to the children. At carnival time in Schopfloch, for instance, children sing a ditty called La Chodesh is really not so hard, in which the Hebrew and Yiddish words are momentarily revived. Here are a few more examples of La Chodesh. Dor is Delet. Doubtful, Usa. Large is Godel. Enough is Dayen. Red is Adom. Work is Meloche. Rest is Manucha, heaven is Shomayem, and the numbers are Olf, Beis, Gimel, Dolet, Hei, Wolf, Yus, Yus, Olf, and so on. For Hebrew speakers, Shocha, Mayim, Lo, Kulev is black coffee, literally black water, no milk. Think about it. Or Kasherosh, pig's head. Or Ale Gimel, Dof. All three are good. Lachodesh was spoken in Schopfloch right through the Hitler era. That's particularly interesting because the Nazis replaced all words of foreign origin with German words. And now I have on the telephone, speaking from his office in Schopfloch, the mayor, Mr. Oswald Czech. Welcome to the program, Mayor Czech. Hello, Mr. Bingham. I'm really glad to have again made contact with Schopfloch after so many years. Because yours is an extraordinary village, particularly in Germany. I'm glad to hear you. Today we can speak about the history of Schopfloch and Lachodisch, the secret language. I'm looking forward to that. Stay tuned because this ranks high on the list among the most interesting stories that I have ever reported. So you don't want to miss that.
And now, here is Walter Bingham. And now I have on the telephone, speaking from Schopenhauer, the mayor, Mr. Oswald Czech. Welcome to the program, Mayor Czech. Hello, Mr. Bingham. Today we can speak about the history of Schopenhauer and Lachodisch, the secret language. How many people live in Schopenhauer today? And is it now called a village or a town? It's almost called a village, but today they live nearly 3,000 inhabitants. Do you have any Jews living there? No. And is Lachudesh still spoken? Yes, some words are still spoken. About 80 or 100 words Uh are known in the language, in the idiom of the inhabitants. So are those words used in the context of daily normal conversation? Yes. For example, my name is not Mayer, my name is Schofet. They still call you the Schofet? Yes, yes. I see. And the, the, chi- the children are the Kone, or the dog is a Caleb. That's Hebrew, really. What are you doing to keep the language alive? Are there any courses where people can learn it? Because Mayor Hans Rainer Hoffmann, some 25 years ago, was very interested in that. Yes. And what's the attitude of the younger generation? Are they interested in Lachudesh? Yes, there are some courses in the school or in the kindergarten for the children is very interested because the name is for children is Kone. The book that Mayor Hoffman published also lists the word Yelet for child, which is pure Hebrew. Yeah, they want to listen to this. There are some lessons, some courses, yes. Do you yourself speak any Lachodesh that you called the secret language? Well, I know a lot of words or the number a little. If the present older generation now dies out, do you think that part of Schopfloch's history will only be read in books? I hope not. We do something, for example, our carnival club words in the program, so we try to defend it for to be forgotten. Because yeah. Lachodesh is a Jewish-based language, yeah. and because in Germany there is quite a lot of anti-Semitism, does the attitude about Jews, does that exist in any form in Schopfloch? No, in, in Schopfloch lived the Jewish people uh, since 500 years, and it started in the 14th century, and perhaps in the early 19th century, 25% of the inhabitants were Jewish people. The Jewish and the Christian people, there's a friendly existence. That's good to hear. I know that not so many years ago, you used to have Jewish tourists, in fact, even Jewish tour groups, to hear Lachodesh spoken. Do you still have that today? Jewish people from all over the world, because in Schopfloch is a great Jewish cemetery, and they look for their grandpas. So another reason for Jews to come to Schopfloch is to look for the graves of their ancestors. Yes, and now we have a big project to document the tombstones in that cemetery, and we put it in a data bank in the World Wide Web. We want to translate the Hebraic the Hebrew transcription of the tombstones, the Arctic style, and the biographic dates from the persons. So it's a big project sponsored by the EU, European money. The project is nearly finished. I repeat, the project is not finished. And you can see it in the World Wide Web. In English, it's... Jewish dash cemetery dash shopfloch dot de. When you see the word website, click on the German title. There you can do research. Do you have any hotels in Shopfloch? Yes, we have little hotels or in Dingelsbühel nearby there are hotels. But if you get Jewish visitors who want yeah. to eat kosher, are there any such facilities? Yes, because the restaurant is able to do kosher eating. In 
2013, Michael Hanan from Devo Tail Productions from Haifa. DVT Productions. Made a film over the language Lahodish. The title is Mayan is Water and Yayan is Wine. When he lived here, he come eating kosher. Wonderful. So you are interested in Jewish tourism? Yeah, yeah, of course. What's the main occupation of the people in Schopfloch? Uh, tourism would be very nice, but do they go out of the village to work? In Schopfloch there are perhaps 600 places for working. Is there no industry or agriculture? It's handwork. Trades and craftsmen. Uh, no agriculture. Agriculture in the little villages outside of Schopflok, yes, but in Schopflok himself not. I know that in the old days there was a Jewish school in Schopflok and there was a synagogue in one of the main roads. What happened to those buildings? The Jewish school house is here, but it is in private owner. It's closed. And the synagogue was destroyed in 1938. That was during the terrible Kristallnacht. And there's only the places. And in the cemetery, the Tahara house is also destroyed. That's the chapel. Are the gates of the cemetery locked to prevent vandalism by, let's say, neo-Nazis or other Jew haters? The gate is locked, but you can get a key and you can visit the cemetery. We have no destroyer by neo-Nazis. And I'm very proud that this doesn't happen. If people want to get in touch with you and ask questions about the graves of their family, how do they reach you? By email to the community or Oswald. O-S-W-A-L-D dot C-Z-E-C-H at Mark M-A-R-K-T dash Schopfloch that's S-C-H-O-P-F-L-O-C-H dot D-E It was wonderful speaking to you again in Schopfloch and I want to wish you and your village lots of success with tourism and of course free of the coronavirus. Thank you, Mr. Bingham. Thank you very much. Last week, it was Amanpour on CNN who used Kristallnacht, the beginning of the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews, to compare with President Trump's action. This week, it's the misnamed Holocaust Memorial Resource and Education Center in Florida that is insulting the victims of the Holocaust by hosting an exhibit about the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. That, by implication, is to elevate the killing of Floyd, a petty criminal, however unjustified, to the historic level of the Holocaust of six million innocent women and men, including one and a half million children, an event that will be recorded in the history books for generations. Who knows to what depth these pseudo-intellectuals will sink next week? My experience of living in Germany in the early 1930s tells me that today the Jews of Europe are living in a dream world if they believe that their comfortable life will continue and that the current wave of antisemitism is a temporary phase that is best ignored and will be defeated in the same way that the Jew-hating leader of the British Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, was ousted. One only needs to study the statistics to see that antisemitism is on the rise. Nearly 1,500 antisemitic crimes were recorded in the EU and that 22% of all hate crimes in 2019 were against Jews, and that figure can be expected to be even higher in 2020. In an interview on I-24 television, 
the chief executive of the campaign against anti-Semitism, Gideon Falter, had this to say. I think also it's really important just to pick up on what you just said, which is the fact that people aren't surprised by this. And that tells us two things. One, it tells us that this has been going on a long time. Two, it tells us that they've got used to it. And the fact that people are getting used to this level of hatred against Jews tells us exactly how close to the precipice Europe is. And in some cases, I would argue that European Jewish communities are fearful of their future and probably aren't going to be sure of their future again. We've got to look at the causes of this. And, you know, we've been talking for a very long time about the far right in Europe. But the fact is that the far right is just one part of the equation. We've also got Islamist anti-Semitism, which is fueled, including by the Iranian regime. And we've also got far left anti-Semitism, which in many cases has actually become allied to far uh, Islamist anti-Semitism. And we've also got links now between the far left and the far right in certain situations where, although they agree on pretty much nothing else, they agree on hating Jews. And it's a very worrying situation. We've seen in Britain how close Britain came with the near election of an anti-Semite, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, nearly got elected as prime minister of the country uh, a couple of years ago. He then had a crushing electoral defeat last year. And we are now seeing European Jewish communities. We're seeing the murderous attacks on Jews in Toulouse, in Paris, in Copenhagen. We're seeing... Jews being gunned down. The in Halle, the, the synagogue was thankfully not breached, but two passers by in the street, innocent people, were killed because the attacker couldn't enter the synagogue. It's a very worrying time for Jews in Europe. Keep it here, there's more after this break. And now, here is Walter Bingham. So one of the things that we do at Campaign Against Anti-Semitism is that we monitor anti-Semitism and, and the activity of anti-Semites. And one of the things that we're finding so concerning is that previously, anti-Semites would meet offline, largely, and they would share their ideas with smaller groups of people offline. Now what's been going on for the last several years is anti-Semites moving online and, and, and inciting hatred against Jews online. Now the problem is that the pandemic has caused even more of them to move online than before. Many people who were resistant to moving online now have no option. So actually we're seeing anti-Semitism uh, moving online at an accelerated rate. And that is very worrying because these anti-Semites have access to far larger audiences online than they do offline. So campaign against anti-Semitism referred the Labour Party to the UK's Equality and Human Rights Watchdog and the report that has just been published by that watchdog basically says that uh, under Jeremy Corbyn, anti-Semitism became institutionalized within the Labour Party. And just to break that down for your viewers, the Labour Party used to be the most fiercely anti-racist political party in the UK. The institutionalization of anti-Semitism essentially means that anti-Semitism became part of the system within the Labour Party. And, and the Labour Party actually became... Uh, of itself, a force for spreading and, and harboring anti-Semites. So it's been a very turbulent time. But what we've also seen is that the British electorate absolutely out of hand rejected Jeremy Corbyn. It was one of the worst performances for a Labour politician, I think, in 85 years. So it was an absolutely crushing defeat for Jeremy Corbyn. And part of the reason for that was that British people, even British people who hadn't ever met a Jew, remember the Jewish community in Britain right. is small, it's only a quarter of a million people, the, the British people rejected anti-Semitism, they did not like it, and they rejected the party that, and, the, and the political leader who was espousing it. I can't totally agree with Gideon Falter, firstly, because I believe that Jews in Europe are not aware of the threat against them, and secondly, it was not only anti-Semitism, but mainly Corbyn's far-left policy, why the British people rejected him. Winston Churchill famously said, you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. What that will be depends on which side you're on. As a complete rerun of the total election is not provided for in the American Constitution, 
and I learned this from a listener, it looks from here that all that can be achieved by the Trump team's continuing fight is to reduce Biden's majority, which will not alter the result. The Republicans now need to concentrate on the Senate seat rerun in Georgia. The Republican challenger for seat number one is at present standing at 49.7% behind the Democrat with 49.9% of the votes. According to Georgia law, the winner requires 50%. If the Republican does not reach that figure in the rerun, the incumbent Democrat will prevail. The numbers of seats will then be even and the Democrats are in control because the vice president has the casting vote. There is one more slight chance for the Republicans to win the Senate, but in that race their candidate is very far behind and the Democrat will most probably retain the seat. Interestingly, that Democrat, a pastor, once said that you cannot serve God and the military at the same time. And the Republicans believe that they can use that stupid remark to turn the tables. You see, by controlling the Senate, the Republicans would make life difficult for the Democrat agenda to succeed. This week, President-elect Biden revealed the members of his cabinet for foreign policy and security. A very experienced group, most of whom are members of the team with which Biden worked while vice president to President Obama. Each one made some brief remarks to thank President-elect Biden for having gained his trust. In Vice President-elect Kamala Harris's remarks to sum up the ceremony, one phrase struck me as particularly significant. Remembering that the new team standing behind her were largely in the field of foreign policy, she spoke of re-establishing foreign relations. That, for me, has an ominous ring. Did she refer to Iran? Or even to work closely with China? the Biden family's financial hunting ground? It remains to be seen. There are now voices, both Israeli and foreign, that call for Benjamin Netanyahu to be awarded the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize. Prominent among them is Lord David Trimble of Northern Ireland, the Nobel Prize laureate for 1998 for his effort to bring peace to Northern Ireland. Neither Prime Minister Rabin and Foreign Minister Peres, both recipients of this prestigious award in 1994 for having signed the now defunct Oslo Accords with Yasser Arafat, have actually achieved any peace agreements. So it would be fitting to award the 2021 prize for the real achievements of peace between the UEA, Bahrain, possibly Sudan and Saudi Arabia, and Israel. The prize should be shared between President Trump and every leader of the affected countries. After all, it was a great achievement of Trump to bring these Arab nations to the table with Israel, even if it was his and Netanyahu's Iran policy that helped it along. They each deserve recognition. The winner or winners will be announced in October. Israel's head of state is the president. The powers of the president are generally equivalent to those held by heads of state in other parliamentary democracies and in Israel are largely dictated by basic law, much of which is contained in the Declaration of Independence. The president is elected by an absolute majority of Knesset members in a secret ballot. It's a non-executive ceremonial position held for one only seven-year term and every Israeli citizen is eligible. 
Reuven Rivlin is the present incumbent and his term expires in June 2021. So now both likely and unlikely contenders are beginning to throw their hats into the ring. It is known that Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is indicted on several alleged criminal offences, is eyeing the position. Not only because he believes that he deserves it as a reward for his achievements, but more importantly as a vehicle to protect him from prosecution, because a president is immune from court proceedings. The Knesset may, however, by resolution, remove the president from office if it finds that he is unworthy of his office owing to conduct unbecoming his status as president of the state or for reasons of health that make him permanently unable to carry out his function. The indictments can then be reinstated. There is a large body of opinion in Israel that Netanyahu's unbecoming conduct while Prime Minister does already disqualify him from serving as President. I believe he now deserves a very long rest in his Caesarea home by the sea. Among other names that have been mentioned is Isaac Herzog, the present head of the Jewish Agency, and Yehuda Glick, former Knesset member and activist campaigning to expand Jewish access to the Temple Mount. No doubt several others will yet come forward or be nominated. The objections to the appointment of Effie Etam as chairman of the board of Yad Vashem is gaining momentum. Groups of Holocaust survivors and second-generation survivors have gathered outside the home of Higher Education Minister Zef Elkin to protest his decision. They respect Effie Etam as a right-wing politician, but object to his appointment because his several remarks about Palestinian Arabs are considered racist and these controversial comments undermine the legitimacy of Yad Vashem. Elkin's office offered a feeble excuse that there are other Holocaust survivors who back Etam's candidacy. The Jerusalem Post quotes this statement from Elkin's office. Minister Elkin is determined in his opinion to appoint Mr. Etam to the position of Yad Vashem chairman. Etam dedicated the majority of his life to substantive service to the State of Israel and he has many qualifications. End of quote. Well, Minister Elkin, there is no dispute that Etam has many qualifications, but none in the field of education and specifically none in Holocaust research and education. That is the reason why you are mistaken in your choice. Now, some late political news. Unless Prime Minister Netanyahu and the leader of Blue and White, General Gantz, stop bickering and come to an agreement about the budget, a general election in March is on the horizon. And to end, here is an important security announcement. In light of the assassination of Iran's most senior nuclear scientist, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, that is blamed on Israel, it is suggested to be aware of all suspicious activity around your environment. This includes vehicles, individuals, and unattended objects. Do not have a preconceived idea of who a suspicious person may be. The individual can be of any age, gender, or race. Be mindful of what a proxy is. They can be any individual of any gender, age, or age ethnicity who either knowingly or unknowingly has been sent by a terror organization to gather hostile reconnaissance on an installation or attempt to gain access to an installation and therefore question any suspicious individuals or anyone possibly gathering information outside your home or office or place of work. It is critical that these concerns are taken seriously and that strong and effective security on the grounds is enforced. That's the end for today 
As usual, I hope, with God's help, to be back again next week with more news, views and interviews from Israel and the rest of the Jewish world. Until then, this is Walter Bingham wishing you a good week, a safe week and, very importantly, please drop in on your elderly neighbour. In these COVID times, it's even more important. I do hope you heed my regular appeals. Thank you. Goodbye.